Thanks very much. Um, right, so my presentation has got the very dull title of Wording and Structure of DAC Reports, but I will attempt to keep it interesting. So what am I going to talk about? Um, I'm going to start off with the different perspectives on what a DAC is between what consultants think they are and what the local authorities think they are. And that might explain some of the arguments we're having with each other over them. I, I'm going to talk about enforceability and wording, uh, trying to get the application to mean what it says. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, different types of um, DAC reports, the ones that are based on going through all the bullet points um, and the ones that are focused um, just on the provisions and don't bother with going through all of the bullet points. Um, I'm not going to talk about what the technical guidance document says or how to comply. I'm just going to talk about how to demonstrate compliance. Um, and this lecture is kind of cut from three lectures I usually give in training, um, and it normally takes four hours, so I'm going to try and cut it down to one. Um, so I was trying to think about what formed my opinion on DACs, so I came up with a list, and it was 13 years, uh, minions, a 10 metre square porch, two week holiday, um, the mic working? Um, an ice cream machine, um, and Pfizer tablets, uh, but not for the reason you think. So 13 years, I've done 544 DACs on our list, and that's kind of covered every sort of building. Um, minions, um, for the last couple of years, I've been training all the new people and in, coming into our offices um, and taking them from not knowing anything about part M up to a point where they can grant the cert, uh, and I'm not even going to look at it anymore. Um, and I've done about another 330 certs that way. And I suppose the point to make on that is that when you're training people and when you're trying to explain part M and explain why you're doing stuff, it forces you to think about it an awful lot more. Um, the 10 metre squared porch, the first DAC, DAC I did was for a 10 metre squared porch onto a college and it was probably the worst DAC I ever did. The guy was writing page after page after page of all the things he was going to do and invariably there was mistakes in it. Um, and I was doing this and I was thinking there's got to be a better way of doing a search than this. Um, two week holiday, I went away from holidays, came back after two weeks and there was 40 DACs waiting for me when I got back. And I thought I'm going to have to be able to do these a bit easier. An ice cream machine, I inspected a building that had an ice cream machine with a big glass wall right in front with absolutely zero marking on it. And the builder was arguing with me about it. I'll show you the picture of that one later. Um, so from that, I took the, the DAC report has got to be enforceable. Um, and because the builders will argue everything. And then last, the I, the area I cover includes Ring of Skiddy, <clears throat> which covers like, all the major chemical plants in the country. I've got Pfizer, Biomarin, Janssen, GE Healthcare, Novartis, Eli Lilly. I think I've done about 50 of those between them. And they're really complicated buildings. I think one of the first ones I got was for a 42,000 meter squared factory. Um, and, you know, when you're doing those higher buildings, you, you know, it, it forces it forced me very early on to start thinking about DACs and thinking about how to do them right and what can kind of go wrong. Um, and the, the main conclusion of all of that was the, the DACs, they needed to be easier for the consultant to prepare and they needed to be easier for us to assess and they had to be enforceable. You know, they can't be less enforceable than the technical guidance document. So I just... In preparation for this, I did a bit of a mini survey and there was two main complaints about DACs and there was two questions um, that I needed to ask. I'm going to set a timer for myself here now just to make sure I'm not running behind. So uh, the two main complaints, first with the building control officers were complaining that the consultants didn't submit the information that they wanted and that the consultants were all doing it different ways and it was all very complicated. And the consultants complaint was that all the different building control authorities all wanted something different. So um, maybe we need a standardized approach so that we're all, um, you know, at least singing off the same hymn sheet. And then there was two questions. So the first one was, what's a DAC? And the second one, which is a very different question, is what actually is a DAC? So the first one, and kind of the previous speakers mentioned this, um, and I think this is the most technical slide on my whole presentation. 
So from the DAC certificate itself is the Building Control Authority hereby certifies that the works to which the application relates, if constructed in accordance with the plan specifications particulars, would comply with the requirements of Part M. So the key thing to note there is it's a certificate of compliance. It's not an opinion. It's not an outline approval. It's not an error that looks okay to me. It's a certificate, so it has to be right. And it certifies that the compliance with the requirements of Part M, not with the technical guidance document. No, I suppose the key thing for the any assigned certifiers is the all the certifiers love uh, ancillary certs. So the fire cert and the DAC are the best ancillary cert you're going to get because the building control authority has certified that it is compliant. So if you don't bother reading the DAC or if you deviate from it or if you make changes from it. The assigned certifier is now certifying the building, not the building control authority anymore. So, you know, if you sign cert the certificate of compliance completion while deviating from the DAC, you're now taking responsibility for the design. So the assigned certifier should be very cautious about deviating from the DAC or the fire cert design. Because as I said, it's the best comfort blanket you're going to get. So what happens if you grant bad DAC? So it's a certificate of compliance. So if there's any errors in the DAC when you grant it, they are now certified as compliant. So if you forgot, you know, if you went for a big item, like you forgot to put a lift in, um, building control person can go to site and say, oh, you have to put a lift in, you're not compliant, because the first thing the builder will say to you is, but hang on, you just certified that it is compliant without a lift. You know, you, can, you can't complain that it doesn't comply after just certifying it. And down to small things, if something is vaguely, you know, if there's a door with no vision panel on the in the DAC and you've granted it, you can now not force them to put the vision panel in regardless of what technical guidance document says because you've just certified that it's okay not to have one. Um, so I'm granting the DAC, a bad DAC is all well and good until you go try to enforce it afterwards. So the building control officer shouldn't accept anything less than um, that anything less enforceable than what's written in the technical guidance document. And I suppose for the consultants, if you're thinking your building control person assessing the DAC has been a bit too picky, they need to be picky because they're certifying it, whereas you're only making an application. So then on to the next question, what actually is a DAC? So like, what are we supposed to be assessing? So is it a concept check? Are we just checking that the building does have a lift? Or are we doing a design check that, yes, there's a lift in the building and it'll comply with section 1.3.4 point whatever it is? Or are we doing a details check? Are we supposed to be checking the height of the button of the lift control above the floor and checking what shade of black the floor and the lift is? Um, and rightly or wrongly, the fire starts tend towards the higher level, towards more concept checks with a bit of design check, whereas the DAC applications, a lot of them um, tend to repeat you know, large amounts of the bullet points out of the guidance. So the DACs tend more to be towards a details check. So I suppose, why is that? And what the answer is, if you look and compare technical guidance document B and technical guidance document M. So B is generally high level guidance. It's telling you the, the roof should be fire resisting and it might go off and tell you to go and look at the table to get the, the value. But you know, it, it's not getting into the detail of telling you how many screws are supposed to be in the plasterboard that go into the wall. Whereas the technical guidance document has got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bullet points. I think I counted it once out of boredom and I think there was 350 in section one alone. Um, you know, so it's going into the level of details of what height the door handle is. So was it, it was very easy temptation with all the bullet points in the guidance, just to repeat them all in the, in the application report. Uh, and that's something you wouldn't dream of doing in a fire cert. Like if you had a fire cert, the fire officer isn't going to ask for, and you're not going to tell them what height the three hinges are above the floor, what grade the brass in the hinges is. No, you're just going to go that it is a fire door. It's going to comply with Appendix B. And beyond that, all you want to know is it a, is it an FD60 or an FD30? And does it have smoke seals or not? You're not going to get into the repeating the whole lot of Appendix B. So getting back to this slide again, so is it a concept check, a details check, or design check? So it's, the answer is it's, it's probably a bit of all three. Um, and whatever the consultant submits, you have to check. So if the consultant gives you all 350 bullet points, you've got to proofread all 350 bullet points. But I suppose the question is, do you need to do that? So in the example I gave there is, 
if the report says that the lift will comply with paragraph 1.3.4.2 of technical guidance document M 2010, do you need to really, do you really need to repeat all 22 bullet points specifying the height of the, the, the buttons on the above the floor? So just to kind of, kind of summarize some of the dis differences between what maybe consultants are thinking and access cert is and what building control are thinking about it. So what's the DAC? For the consultant, it's a proposal. But for us, it's a certificate. So that's a higher, a higher level of responsibility. So what's the aim? The consultant, if they're trying to put in all the things that they can think of, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the stuff that they've left out. Understanding the consultant should know very well what the job is. They've probably been working on it for months, whereas it's now our first time. So if the consultant thinks we're asking them a silly question, it's because it's our first time seeing the job and you might have left something out because it's blindingly obvious to you, but it's not obvious to us because we, you know, we haven't seen it before. Compliance, they invariably, and fingers crossed, hopefully the consultants all intend to comply. For the building control person, that's all well and good. The consultant intended to comply, but once he's off the job, we've got to deal with the builder who, if he gets something wrong, probably doesn't want to fix it. Um, all the bullet points, some consultants that I spoke to um, and in a lot of reports, they want to put in all the bullet points because they want to make it a specification that they can give to the client. Um, that was probably never what the DAC process was intended for. Um, and for building control, some people wanted all the bullet points and others like myself don't want all the bullet points. Um, and then like unclear wording in the report, the consultant will go, oh, of course, that's what I meant, or I know what I meant. Whereas for the building control person is, well, that's not really what you wrote and would it stand up in court if I tried to, to argue the toss with you about it. And then omitted items, the consultant can say, oh, I'll sort that out on site. But that's no good to the building control because we've got to certify it now and we don't get a second bite of the cherry to go back afterwards. So, so because the building control officer has to certify that it is compliant and they don't get to go back, they, for them, they, they're treating the whole thing as a higher standard. So DAC templates then, um, there's a couple of different versions out there and these are one way of getting a more consistent approach between what the consultants are giving us and what we're looking for. Um, just a thought of the day for anybody who says they don't like templates because a few people have said it to me over the years. If the consultant isn't using your template, you're using their template. Um, and I know that our template is good, so we're happy with it. If you want to write your, as a building control, if you want to write your own template and put your good stuff in it, um, then if the consultants would use it, it'd be great. But if if you're if they're not using your one, you're using theirs. And the question is, is theirs any good? So what should a DAC template be? Um, it's not a magic bullet, but it's only a framework to hang the application specific information. So the always the same information. So the height of the door handle above the floor, um, the level of color contrast you need, that's always going to be the same. So if you have a template, you can put the inform that always the same information into the template. So you don't have to rewrite it every time. So you don't wind up with mistakes in it and then provide space for the consultant to put in the application specific information. So now every consultant is doing some variety of this themselves. You know, they're not rewriting every single application from scratch. They're getting the previous application that they did and they're taking out the mention of the, the apartments and then they're putting in the mentions of the um, industrial building. So to one degree or the other, they're working off their template. So looking at the guidance that's in technical guidance document, it's made up of two types of guidance. There's the bullet points. So there's the height of the door handles um, on the accessible entrance. There's the what heights the sink is supposed to be above the floor, what height the handrail is supposed to be on the steps. And that's kind of fixed guidance. It's always the same unless there's some particular reason for, for deviating from it. And then there's the provisions. These are the things that change. So it's all well and good telling me what height the door handles and the accessible entrances is, but a lot of applications, they never actually tell you which door is the accessible entrance. Or if they did tell you which door is the accessible entrance, they forgot about the staff door at the back. Uh, so again, you know, it's all well and good telling me the height of the sink in the accessible WC, but the big, you know, the provision is, well, do I have a wheelchair accessible WC or not? And if I do, is it diagram 15A or 15C? Uh, and the last one, you know, again, it's all well and good knowing what height 
handrails are above steps on an approach route, but the question is, should there be steps on the access route in the first place? So the bullet points are fixed. They should always be the same. Whereas the provisions of the variables, these are the things that change. So my question to you is, which one is it more important to check? So the main formats that seem to be out there are, there's the bullet point formats, the, every consultant or at least most of them in the country have written their own version so to one degree or the other they're all roughly of a team some have borrowed bits from other people some have written their own things um, but in the main a lot of these requotes some or all of the 350 bullet points out of section one um, and what i find very uh, invariably with these is to one degree or the other they they don't focus as much on the provisions as maybe they should now look some app, some templates are way better than the other. Some of them are excellent, but some of them are, are very poor. Um, and then you have the provisions templates. There's two main ones out there. There's the 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 local government management service board did one, um, and we did one ourselves in Cork County Council. Um, the the difference between the two is in the applications. We have very few bullet points in in both the LGMA version and in ours. Um, and the entire template is then built around telling me what the provisions are. So rather than focusing on what height the door handle on the accessible entrance is, the application focuses on well, which doors are the accessible entrances and why isn't the staff door at the back an accessible entrance? Um, and so the main concept difference between the two is that, you know, if they tell me that the accessible stairs are going to comply with 1.3.4.3, then the provisions templates don't want to see all 16 bullet points. You know, we might want to see what's the rise and what's the going of the steps. We might want to get the flight rise, but you know, we don't need regurgitating of every one of the other 16 bullet points, which are always all the same. And again, if you were a fire search, you know, you're not going to be asking for how, you know, please confirm that there will be three hinges on the fire door. You just want to know is it a fire door or not? Is it FD60 or is it FD30? And I suppose my point on this is if you spend all your time focusing on checking and rewriting out and going through the 350 bullet points, which are always going to be the same, how much energy and time do you have left then for checking the variables? So uh, if my thought on this, and it might be a bit small, a bit flippant, and I'm sure somebody here will disagree with me, but if you want to have all the bullet points in there, and if you want the whole thing to be a specification for the client, get a stapler, get a copy of technical guidance document M and staple it to the report. Job done. Um, and I suppose my question is, like, if you're just rechecking all 350 fixed bullet points, are you assessing the application or are you proofreading it? You know, if you're only checking things that are always the same, you're just checking, is the text the same as the book or is it the same? So bullet points, templates, um, I'm going to pick on them a small bit. I'm just going to use it as an example of common problems with them. Now, as I say, I'm talking about the principle here of bullet point templates versus the provisions ones. And some consultant applications are way better than others. Some have all the bullet points in and they're excellent. And some put have all the bullet points in and the, the application is poor. So I'm just talking about the principle here. So the, the bullet point um, templates, so they're the, by far they're the most common type of application you're going to get around the country. Um, consultants have made their own, every consultant has made their own version. Some have copied other people. Some have taken bits out of each other's ones. Um, in the main, they focus on regurgitating a lot of the bullet points. Um, and then the problems you can get with them is the wording. The wording is frequently weaker than what's in the technical guidance document, so it's not as enforceable. They're vulnerable to typos and cut, copy, paste errors. You know, you have an application, it's for an office, but then there's reference to the apartments on the third floor because the consultant has forgotten to take that bit out. Um, and the provisions are frequently overlooked. So why wording matters? Nice. Torture chamber unsuitable for wheelchair users. What does that mean? So, you know, weak wording is open to misinterpretation. And if there's misinterpretation, it's less enforceable, it's less accurate, it's more ambiguous. What's going on here? Sorry. The, my screen has gone off. I don't know how to do it. Um, 
And the main thing it does is it lets the builder argue the thoughts. So if the builder has, a, has done something and it's wrong and it's going to cost him money to fix it and he doesn't want to fix it, they'll use every argument and you know every bit of wriggle room to try and get out of doing it. So my thing to building control people is if you have to certify that the works would comply, if you have to certify the design, don't accept the wording that's less enforceable than technical guidance I condemn. So wriggle room, this was the the ice cream machine I had mentioned earlier, the builder in this one argued with me that he didn't need manifestation to glazing because the glazing wasn't full height. And you can see clearly down at the bottom, it's not full height, doesn't go all the way to the floor. It's a, I think it's about, it was about 50 millimeter short. And he also tried to argue that, you know, that the manifestation to glazing would be provided to the fully glazed doors. But that was the screen. So, I mean, this was on the way into a supermarket. It's an ice cream machine. If there's ever a way of getting kids to crash into a bit of glass, this was absolutely it. So, um, you know, if you have weak wording in your report, the builder will try and argue the toss, which is so they don't have to go fix and stuff. So confusing wording. Um, you know, the rise of the steps won't be not less than 150 millimeters. Is that right or wrong? And even if it's right, it meant that you had to stop and think about it. So why didn't you use the correct wording? And, you know, this one might be right, it might be wrong, but, you know, what the consultant meant and what they wrote isn't always the same thing. So um, I'm sure sometimes thought I was being picky when I went back and, you know, corrected their grammar. But it's because what they wrote didn't, you know, wouldn't have held up in court. If I'd have tried to argue the toss on something, you know, it's not them I'd be arguing with, it'd be the builder. And if there was ambiguity there, the builder would be arguing with me. So, you know, don't take anything less enforceable. Don't take a wording weaker than the technical guidance document them. So weak wording, again, one of my, this is one of my favorite. Internal doors will generally comply with the provisions of 1.3.3.2. Well, the consultant knew what he meant. I'm not too sure. So does that mean the doors will in general comply as in, in general, so some doors will and some doors won't? Or does it mean that the door, all the doors will kind of comply, but some bits of them mightn't? So what does it mean? Um, and you can guarantee that, you know, if you go and site and the door is wrong, then the builder will say, ah, but this is one of the doors that generally didn't complain. You know, so they don't want to fix it. Or it'll comply where practical. Well, it wasn't practical here. And then you're back into a panto. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it isn't. Um, so wordings like generally avoided where practical shouldn't be accepted because there's wriggle room there for the builder to go arguing. So, you know, if something is going to deviate from the technical guidance document, tell me what it is, and then I can either agree with you or disagree with you. Whereas if you just put down generally, I, I don't know what you, what, what does that mean? Or again, caveats. So adequate color contrast will be point provided to the painted surfaces. And this one, it's varnished, not painted. So does that mean, you know, if you look very closely there, there is the wheelchair accessible toilet. Uh, and the only distinguishing mark between the two is that there's a skirting down at the bottom. But, you know, the builder here could argue, well, the DAC only said that the painted surface would be not the varnished ones. Now, again, I fully agree it's a stupid argument, but the builder will argue the toss switch on site. Um, so, again, you know, it'd be better if that kind of thing wasn't in the report. Don't use that language or unintended omissions. So the doors would be glazed and therefore vision panels would not be provided. Or is it frosted glass? Will you be able to see through it? Will it be the equivalent of vision panel? You know, no, I know what the consultant meant, but that's not what they said. Sorry, that's not what they wrote. And then misquoting the guidance. So ironmongery will be usable with one hand. So is that what paragraph 1.2.4c says? Is it? It's not, because that ironmongery is usable with one hand. But that's not what the guidance says. The guidance says ironmongery will be usable, usable with the closed fist of one hand, which that isn't. So if you'd have granted your cert on the basis of ironmongery will be usable with one hand, and you had seen that and you tried to get the builder to fix it, he'll tell you, no, it is usable with one hand. So I suppose the point I was making there is that if the consultant puts 
all 350 bullet points into the report, you have to proofread them all. Um, another one of my particular favorites, the wheelchair mindset. Uh, everybody in DACs, they're focused completely on the wheelchairs and they forget about absolutely everybody else. Um, so a great line is the entrance D1 will be accessible to wheelchair users. Great. Will it be accessible to the blind? You know, you have entry control systems. Um, will it be um, will it be suitable for the deaf? So just because the steps up at the door and a wheelchair can't get in doesn't mean you shouldn't put in a suitable entry control system that a deaf or a blind person could use. Or manifestation to glazing, you know, the wheelchair user isn't going to crash into the glass. At worst, they're going to bang their knees off of it. I mean, the only person who's going to get injured off of unmarked glazing is probably you or me who are running and late for a meeting and we're, we walk into the glass. So um, that sentence, again, it's not accurate. The builder would argue, well, I am only providing access for wheelchair users. I'm not providing access for the deaf. And that's not what the technical guidance document says. So if you accept that, you're accepting something less. And then this is another one. So, you know, read through this now and is it as compliant as it looks? So the ramps provided access to the north will be constructed in accordance with paragraph 1.1.3.4 as follows. And then you've A, slopes and landings will be this. You, know, you can read the rest of these now yourself. So it all looks okay. But then when you think about it, so, but hang on now, one of the ramps on that route is on the east, but he's only said he's got the ones in the north would comply. So has he given any undertaking that the one on the east will comply? And has he actually said he's going to comply with paragraph 1.1.3.4? No, he said he'll comply as follows. So he's only said he's going to do A, B, C, D, E. You know, what about the rest of the bullet points that he left out? Because again, the builder would argue, I never said I was going to comply with the paragraph. I only said I was going to comply as follows. So slopes and landing sentence, that looks pretty okay to me. Then the next one, gradients will not exceed one in 20 and nine meters long. For starters, what does that mean? And then what does, does not exceed? So is not exceed mean greater or less, or is it steeper or shallower? Right, so again, there's wriggle room for argument there. The landings will be at least a meter long. Hang on, the landings need to be at least as long as the width of the flight, and the flight is 1.2 meters, so that's wrong. Edge protection will not be provided. Why not? No, the consultant might have said, might have thought, right, well, I'm going to design it that the, the tarmac of the driveway is going to go up level and flush with the, the ramp. But that's not what he said. He just said it's not, it will, will not be provided. So if it turns out that there is a step there, well, why isn't edge protection? Uh, and then the top landing will be at least 1.8 meters squared. Um, and you could blaze past that and go, yeah, yeah that's fine. But 1.8 meters squared isn't the same as 1.8 meter, 1.8 square meters. You know, 1.8 meters squared is probably about 1.4 by 1.4 odd. Um, you can do the maths on that one yourself. So, um, you know, the consultant wrote that they probably thought they were doing the right thing. And in the DAC, you've got to spend time trawling through every single little sentence, checking for all little errors. And there's bound to be errors in there. Um, another great one is, you know, he tells you the lift is going to comply and then he gives you all 22 bullet points, but he only gives you 21 of them. So you then have to go down looking through the list to see which one he left out and then ask him, why did you leave out that one? And he goes, oh, that one doesn't apply because but you never told me that. You know, um, so that's a big disadvantage of putting in all the bullet points. Um, you know, you can, at leisure now you can go through this later and yourself and see which one of them is missing. Um, and then non-resolved variables. So vision panels will not be provided to doors or rooms where privacy or security are required. That's what the technical guidance document says. So that's all fair and good. But we're supposed to be assessing the design. So the question really should be, well, are you providing one or not? That's what we're supposed to be assessing. We're not just checking that he repeated the bullet points faithfully. Um, so who decides? Will the builder decide on site or not? And then, you know, if that sentence was accepted and you went in and there's no vision panel on the door, the builder says, oh, security reasons, privacy reasons. And then you wind up with an argument on site going, oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it isn't. That's what should be assessed in the application. And, you know, the designer should tell you, is he or isn't he putting one in? And then you can either agree with them or disagree with them. So again, the question is, if you're only proofreading the bullet points, 
you know, are you just proofreading or are you actually assessing the application? And the problem with a lot of the bullet point templates is they spend so much time going through the bullet points that they forget about the provisions. Now, again, apologies to anybody who's got a good bullet point template. Some are way better than others, but some of them are really poor. And then vulnerable mistakes. So in this one here, what they've done is they've mixed template information and the specific application information to mix the two of them together. So the accessible entrance ED1 on the north facade will be in accordance with paragraph 1 point, whatever it is. Uh, it will be an 800 wide door and it will be in accordance with paragraph. You can read that now yourself. So the red bits of the template bits, these are what should always apply. So an accessible entrance should always be to 1.2.4. And the blue bits are the application specific information. So you can see he's mixed that together. So my question is, well, what happens when you go to the next application? You know, when the when you know, when the entrance is on the east, you might forget to change the bit about the north, right? Or what happens if you're rewriting the whole sentence, but then you're going to misquote paragraph one point two point four point three? You might put down some other number, which has to go back to being corrected. Um, and with this, because you're spending all your energy writing it all out, you might forget that. Oh, hang on, there's a staff entrance on the other side. And again, in this, you're only committing here, you're only committing that the accessible entrances on the north will comply. What happens if the staff entrances on the east? Will that comply? Because you only said the ones on the north. So again, there's a big danger of mixing the information together because when you rewrite the whole thing out, um, you're leaving yourself open to cut, copy, paste errors and your typos and mis misreferences. Um, my absolute favorite in all of these applications is they spend so lot, they spend loads of time telling you wonderful things. And my favorite ones by a long shot, um, and somebody had this in the report and it was in the report for years and nobody picked it up, was loose mats at entrance lobbies are a notorious trip hazard and therefore they will be provided. And, you know, this had been in the consultant's report for years. And obviously nobody had read it. Um, and another common one, and this is an example, you know, light switches will be installed 90 millimeters above the floor. So the consultant has rewritten that out for the application and, you know, he's forgotten a zero. So, um, you know, it's a danger of transcribing loads and loads of information, um, you know, into a technical report. Um, Non-committal, I like this one as well. Universal design recommends visual contrast between building elements, you know, walls and floors. It's all lovely sentence. Now, my question to the consultant always this was his end. Are you going to do it or not? Because you can see from what he's, he's written, you know, he might have written half a page about how wonderful universal design is, but he never actually said he was going to do it. So what the consultant wrote in the report isn't always what they meant. Um, so a summary of disadvantage of bullet points templates. So there's a greater risk of typos and errors. The wording is often way less enforceable than technical guidance document M. The provisions and the variables um, often suffers because so much energy has been spent on repeating the bullet points. And from the building control officer's point of view, they spent so much time checking all the bullet points that they kind of run out of energy to check and uh, the provisions. Um, and, you know, and just inclusion, you wouldn't look for that level of detail in a fire cert. You know, nobody is submitting a fire cert application telling me, you know, specifying exactly how many screws are going into the plasterboard, what the length of the screws are going to be. They're not going to tell you how many screws and what grade of brass is going in the fire door hinges. And they're not going to tell you that there's three hinges in the fire door. They're just going to tell you it's a, a Appendix B. And it's a fire door, it's an FD30, it's an FD60. So, so my question is, well, why aren't DACs done the same? And, you know, if you focus on the bullet points, you kind of lose the wood for the trees there. What, what are your actual provisions? So now I'm going to move on to provisions templates. Um, and like I say, the, there might be another one, but th these are the, the two main ones that are out there. So both of them came out in, in 2012 when Part M 2010 uh, was coming into effect. So there's the Local Government Management Service Board version. Um, and if you just Google the sample-based approach, um, you'll find it. And then there's a Cork County Council template. So if you just Google possible format um, for M2010, you'll find it on our website. I think we'll have to thank the Donegal, um, the, the, the LGMA version is on their website. So the, the main advantage of them is 
because you're not focusing on checking and regurgitating the couple of hundred bullet points, it lets you focus on actually assessing the application. So identify the provisions. Which entrances are the accessible entrances? You know, for a school, right, the main entrance, the staff entrance, the the entrance to the playground, the one going to the basketball court on the side, you know, lets you focus on what provisions am I getting? It lets you clarify what the variables are. You know, is there a vision panel on the accessible entrance or not? Because that's a variable, it changes. Uh, highlighting deviations. So again, when you're not regurgitating 22 bullet points all about accessible stairs, it lets you tell, lets the consultant tell you the one thing that they are changing. You know, I'm giving you the stairs, it will comply, but, I can only give you a width of 900 for, and here's my reason for it, and here's why it's acceptable. Uh, and then you can assess that or not, rather than rechecking all the things that are the same all the time anyway. Uh, and then dealing with complications, if it's an existing building, it lets you focus on, look, there's an existing ramp here, I can't fix it, but I can do this for you instead. Um, and then enforceability, because you're not going through all the bullet points, a lot of the mistakes that I had mentioned earlier, they don't arise. And again, the key difference between these templates and the bullet points templates is that if the consultant tells you that the accessible stairs will comply with 1.4 or 1.3.4 point, whatever it is, you then don't have to check all the bullet points unless something is deviating from the guidance. Um, so just to compare the LGMA version versus the Cork one. So the main focus on both is the provisions. Um, the structure of the, uh, I'm just going to call it, apologies, I'm going to keep calling it the LGMA version, it's just less of a mouthful. Um, they quote compliance by, by the paragraphs, whereas the Cork one does it by the sections. The structure of theirs works from the part to the whole, whereas ours works from the whole to the part, which sounds boring, but I will elaborate that in a sec. Um, on the template versus the application info in their version, the information is mixed. So again, I, I showed you the example earlier where somebody was telling me about entrance one on the north and it was all the template info and the application info was mixed together. That doesn't happen in, in our template. We deliberately separated them. The bullet points, the, the LGMA version has a few um, and ours has 15 key bullet points that we decided were important. And then the variables, um, not as well dealt with in the LGMA version, whereas they're pinned down religiously in ours. Um, so just as a disadvantage from working from the part to the whole, as opposed to the whole to the part. So this is an extract from the LGMA version. So the first table there was, they were telling you which was the access routes. And then the second one was covering paragraph uh, 112, talking about level access routes. And you can see what it says there in the bottom, in the long box, it said, all level access routes noted above will be in compliance with section of the guidance. But if you look back up on the table, approach route A is only down as gently sloping. Now, surely that route has some level sections in it, it has to have. But here he hasn't committed that those level bits will comply because he said only the ones noted above will comply. Now that wouldn't apply in the Cork template because the Cork template starts with everything will comply. Um, and again, the advantage of separating information. So um, the first box there, the big one, that's the LGMA's version on the car parking. So he's written all about, uh, you probably can't see it in too much detail there, but he's, you can see he's written a big long paragraph and he's mixed in the number of parking spaces he has um, with reference to paragraph 1.1.5 .1 and diagram eight and nine. But when he comes to doing the next application, that whole section has got to get rewritten. And it's very then easy to either leave the references to the car parking and the previous application in, or it's very easy to misquote the paragraph you're doing. Now that doesn't arise in the Cork template because down below we have two separate boxes. So the first box is the commitment to comply. They'll all comply with section 1.1 blanket. It's all going to comply. And after that, we have a totally separate heading of, well, what parking are you giving me? So I can't have a cut, copy, paste error in my version. And when the consultant is going from one application to the other, all the technical references remain in the template part, they don't change. He only has to change the gray bit there um, and just tell me, well, what part can are you give me? And then I can argue, but hang on, you need three spaces, not two spaces. Um, so 
um, how we got on with it. So it it came out, we brought out the 2010 version. We originally had an M2000 version, and then we brought out an M2010 version in, 20, in 2012. Um, and it's been used by all local consultants for about 10 years. There's, I think there's one or two of them use the template, but have a few changes of their own in there. That's fine. They can do it whatever way they want. But we usually just put four or five standard conditions every time to cover their rewarding. Um, most out of cons county consultants who come into us more than once all use the template as well. So for people here, building it off, people who are in other counties, you know, consultants who are giving you a bad report are giving me an application using my template that I'm very happy with. Um, and overall, it, it's used for about 90% of the applications we receive. Uh, which makes it very easy for the consultants because they know exactly what we want. They know the information we want. Um, they know the format we need. Um, and it makes it very easy for them to give us the application and it gets rid of a host of errors. Um, and it makes it very easy for us because it's forcing the consultant to give us the information that we wanted in the format that we wanted. And everybody's happy. We also have an addendum for covering flats. Uh, we have an addendum for covering industrial production floors. Um, Again, getting back to the uh, dealing with Ring of Skiddy and all the chemical plants down there. Um, and for all the chemical plants that we have done, I have never granted a dispensation for any of them. And none of them have been granted on the basis of there would be no people with disabilities in them. No, obviously excluding a tiny substation thing that nobody's gone into, but they're exempt from DSEs anyway. The advantage of consultants is there's a consistency. They know exactly what we want. They know how we want to give it. And it makes it e very easy for them to write the report because all they got to do is re tell us what their provisions are in plain English. They don't have to go regurgitating what the guidance says. Um, and you know, not to be forgotten, the consultant is perfectly entitled to submit the application in any format they want, as long as it, they give us all the information that we need. But as I said, you know, no local, I can't remember the last time a consultant gave me, a local consultant gave me an application that didn't use the template. Um, the key concept is that unlike technical guidance document B, there's no, there's no purpose groups. So the guidance is always the same. So in that basis, it should be possible to give all the technical references, put it into the template, do it once, get it right, proofread it, do it again, and that's the always the same information. And after that then provides space for them to give us the application specific information, you know, which doors are the accessible entrances? Are there steps on the access route or not? Are you giving me a 15A toilet or a 15B toilet? And why aren't you giving me the 15A toilet? Why, can, why do you only have room for the 15B? You know, and it gives room for the explanations, for the provisions, the variables. And if they're deviating from the guidance for some particular reason, it gives them room to tell me that without getting bogged down and all the stuff that's not going to change. So the template structure. So the first part is the template bit. It shouldn't need to change. And we specifically wrote this so that it always applied. Now, the way we wrote it is I wrote it. I got it absolutely perfect. I went shooting my head uh, to make sure that there was no wriggle room. I gave it to Niall Welton uh, and then he went through it and told me all the things I did wrong. And then I went back and did it again. And we kept going until it covered every base that we thought we needed. Um, so up top is the statements of compliance. So it, you know, for access routes, it tells you right up top, all the access routes will comply with the relevant sections of the guidance. It does it, it gets it right. And then after that, then there's a couple of bullet, a couple of bullet points under general information headings, you know, ones that were important bullet points or things that pin down variables, things that help the template to work. And after that, then there's tables and particular information headings. And the idea is that the consultant only needs to write into the gray bits. In, they only need to write into the tables. They only need to write under particular information headings. And they don't need to go fiddling with any of the technical references. So the format rules, identify your provisions. Tell me what, which routes are your access routes. Identify, the, clarify the variables. Are there steps on the access routes or not? Is there a vision panel on door seven or not? Um, which ones, which doors are the accessible entrances? Why isn't the staff entrance an accessible entrance? Explaining deviations from the guidance. And again, because you're not getting bogged down going through all the bullet points, you can focus on the ones that are changing. And then the other last rule is don't blanket reference section two. Section two says you should comply with section one unless you can't comply. Um, in which case it gives you a couple of fallbacks. So 
if you're going to deviate, if you're going to go to section two, tell us what that one specific thing is, you know, rather than blanket referencing it. So like if you if you change, if you one of your access routes can't fully comply, if you change the template and say it'll play with section two, not section one, well, then I don't know what I'm getting because which variables are, aren't you taking up? Why is it or isn't it practical to provide a 1.8 meter landing at the front door? Um, and then the last two rules is resist all temptation wherever possible to edit the template section because it always creates errors. It was written that you don't need to change it and only write in the gray sections. So template up top says, all access routes will comply with section 1.1. If you decide, oh, only my access routes on the north, or my only access routes are on the north, and if you change my template to say all access routes in the north will comply, I might then ask you, well, what about the one on the northeast? And when you come to the next application, you know, have an error. So the golden rules are don't change the template parts, do all your writing in the template parts. Particular information headings that we've provided then. So this is a structure for the consultant to put in the application specific information that they need to give us. So what are your provisions? Describe them in plain English because you're not burdened with the technical reference anymore. Clarify the variables. What can't you do? Justify it. What don't you want to do? Justify it. You know, what's existing and what's, you know, what you can't make to section one. You can tell me what that is and I can evaluate what you're doing. And, you know, if you're going to section two, give me the section two backstop value. And again, the template's only a framework for you to give the information. So over the years, people have complained about templates and have complained that you shouldn't be using a template or complained about our template. Invariably, that's because, you know, they've got to, the applicant has got to put in the application specific information. You can't just get our template, leave it blank, put a cover sheet on it and give it in. You need to tell us what are your provisions, what are the variables, explain what's going on. So, you, you, you know, the, the template isn't just a blank thing to make it, you know, that you can send in the same thing without editing anything. So typical format, uh, just to give you an example. So number one is the safety compliance. So circulation within the building will be in accordance with section 1.3 of technical guidance document. That's everything covered now. He's just committed to everything. So horizontal will comply with 133, vertical will comply with 134. I could have left those two out because he said everything was going to comply in the first place. Bullet points, again, we just put in a couple of ones here that we thought were important. And in this one, we thought we put it in because we thought people were going to forget it. So all corridors and passages will have a clear unobstructed width of at least 1200 millimeters. Elements such as corridors, radiators, fire hoses will not project into the width. So if he shows you a corridor and it's dimensioned 1200 under the drawing, he's now committed that it's going to be 1200 and there's nothing is going to obstruct that. And then, so that's the template part. There's, regardless of what the building is, there is no need to change that. And then the application specific information, he can then tell me about stuff. So if he wants to say, look, at one point there on the second floor next to the staff canteen, I do have one narrow bit. Here's what it is. Here's why I couldn't avoid it. And here's what I'm giving in compensation about it. So, for example, another example, then dealing with accessible entrances, statement of compliant up top said, it basically says all accessible entrances will comply. And after that, the table is, well, here are the accessible entrances I have. And again, the table is set up to get the key info we want. So accessible entrances, which ones are the accessible entrances? And then there's two variables, which is how wide is it? So we're forcing them to give us that information and we're forcing the consultant to think about it. And the vision panels are a variable. Well, are you giving us a vision panel or not? And we have it there. Um, and then there's a particular information heading below for, um, well, do you have anything to say about the doors? So in the case of this one, ETO1, if you look at the drawing, it might've had no leading edge, but he's told me here, look, it's gonna be a power operated door. So therefore he doesn't need, to, he doesn't lead the, the 300 mil leading edge maybe. Um, and again, just to compare this to a, a typical bullet point application, you know, you can see in mine, it's very clear here, which entrances are the accessible entrances, what are the variables, and you can't, you know, you'd really want to go to your way to make a cut, copy, paste error. Whereas in the a typical bullet point application and where you've mixed the information together, it's all mushed in together. Uh, it's very easy to forget stuff. It's very easy to misquote the guidance. It's very easy to forget some of the entrances. Um, and it's very easy to cut, copy, paste errors. 
But again, so this doesn't arise in our template because structure is set up to get the info. Um, and just as another example, you know, access routes, what we have in the box there. So for each access route, we have a table. <clears throat> and in that, what we're after is what's the key info. So I suppose the, the difference is the way we assessed access routes than other people is, you know, um, most others would have would talk about the level routes, the slope routes, the step routes, the ramp routes, whereas we're thinking of a route as a whole. So a route might be from A to B, and it might have some steps, it might have a ramp, it might have a slope or not, but we're dealing with it as a whole. And again, our template is set up to be whole to the part so it works. So what's in the table is the key info we wanted. So what's the maximum level of level difference? You know, um, so, and then what's the minimum width, what's the maximum gradient? So if somebody tells me the maximum level difference is 100 mil, but he's got steps on it, it's immediately clear to me, oh, hang on now, why have you got steps? Um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm catching him there for, you know, are there steps on the route, yes or no? And if he says no, then there can't be. And then maximum gradient, what is the maximum gradient? Now, my view on this is the, you know, there's no point in pinning the consultant down to is the route going to be one in 34 or one in 35 or one in 36, because it's going to change. You know, if he puts in a gentle slope, then, you know, something's going to change on site. So as long as it's still a gentle slope, I don't really mind if it's one in 30 or one in 40, as long as it's still a gentle slope, unless there's a specific reason that I might have to ask him about it. So again, I'm asking, you know, the main thing I care about here is, has he put ramps in? And if he has put ramps in, I can then go focus on the provisions and say, well, why is there a ramp? You don't need, you didn't need a ramp. And again, on the drawings, we would always look for, give me the route with a line from A to B. So the route is going from, you know, ED02, to the existing grain store door in this example you know it could be from the designated parking to door one you know so it, it's very clear there where's the route and it's very clear for everybody what's on the route and what's not on the route um just as an example you know why did we ask for maximum level difference and again this would be a very common one for anybody who's done a school prefab you know there might be ramps up to the door or there might be steps up to the door you know and consultant is saying well you know wheelchair access is not possible due to the level difference so my first question here is, well, why did you put the building up on so many blocks? You know, why did it have to be that high? Why can't you lower it? Why can't you build it into the ground a bit? Um, you know, so if you'd have taken out a couple of those blocks, you could have got a ramp in. If you'd have taken more of them out, you could have got uh, a gentle slope in. And again, because I'm not focusing on regurgitating and proofreading all 350 bullet points, I can focus on the provisions. Um, the wording in, the, in our template, again, is, is specifically designed to be enforceable. Um, so just here are just two examples of the bullet points. So the first one there, which, you know, where vertical pull handles are provided. And the reason that one is in there is because the wording in the technical guidance document is very poor. It's very hard to read. And if you compare it to the um, approved document B, at one point, I think it forgets to clarify one of the heights is actually the bottom of the rail. It leaves it out. It, um, it's confusing. So a lot of consultants were stumbling over that. So we put that bullet point in to clarify it. And then the last one then is, again, as I had mentioned, you know, we should be checking, you know, are there vision panels on doors or not so that we can agree or disagree whether there's a security or privacy reason. Um, you know, very often you'd see an application and they go, oh, I don't want a vision panel on the door for security or for privacy reasons of security. But then there's a huge big window next to it. You know, if you can put the window in, you can put a vision panel on the door because it's a safety item. So our template, our template takes care of that. So the template says vision panels will be provided to all doors other than those leading directly to sanitary conveniences and closets, except we're listed here. So he's just, you know, if you want to not have a vision panel, then tell me here. Otherwise, you've just committed that they all will. And again, I'm working from the whole to the part. And again, we're very careful in our choosing of words here. We use the word closets rather than stores because store could be anything like stores could be done stores. Whereas closet has got to be something small. So again, the wording, every word in the template was very, very carefully chosen. Myself and Niall Welton, who did a lot of the writing on it, we went back and forth. We went around and around and around. And every thought I, time I thought I had a wording, I gave it to, to Niall and I gave him the, the task of, you know, break this put on your bad builder hat and see if you can wriggle out of it. Um, and we only stopped changing it when, when we couldn't wriggle any further. So dealing with section two, again, what the guidance says is it must comply with section one unless it isn't practical. 
So if you immediately go to, oh, well, everything's going to be section two, well, is it or isn't practical and what are and aren't you doing? So if it's not practical to go to section two, explain exactly the one thing you can't do. And our, the, the example we use in the template, we deliberately put in a couple of problems. So in one of them, there was the, the accessible entrance couldn't have a full size landing and we gave a really good reason why you couldn't have it. Um, and then we had the backstop, well, section two says 1.5 is okay, so that's what I've given you. Um, but the golden rule is don't change our template, don't change it to the whole thing to section two, because then you don't know what you're getting. Um, and again, examples of um, particular information section, you know, dealing with section two. So um, <clears throat> again, you can read these yourself, like the second one, you know, at entrance three, the double doors will be replaced with a single meter wide door to achieve this clear width is necessary to reduce the leading edge to less than 300 mil in compensating the door will be constructed as a power door. So here he's going to section, you know, here I'm explaining why I'm not complying with the guidance. You know, or just as another example of how to use the, the use of the template properly, you know, an existing door, a DDO2, uh, is between two structural columns. It's not practical to provide a meter wide door. A new 850 door will be provided by removing the side panels. This weight is considered acceptable in accordance with section two. So here I'm referencing section two, but now everybody knows what they're getting. Whereas if you'd have just said the entrance will be to section two, well, are you changing the door or not? Am I getting a meter? Am I getting 800? If I'm only getting 800, well, why am I only getting 800? And why couldn't you have gotten rid of the side panels? Um, again, there's notes are built into it to help. Um, and these are parts of the template that to help you assess the drawing. So um, sanitary facilities are clearly defined in the drawing, that's fine. And then the provision and exact position of all new features within the sanitary facilities, grab rails, sinks, et cetera, will be in accordance with section 1.1 of the guidance, including diagrams, unless specifically noted here. Now, the reason for that one is, is like, if you don't have that, then if he gives you a drawing, you're gonna to have to start scaling off the height of the soap dispenser, which, you know, and it's totally unreasonable. Um, we can't do it, you know, as in another example, you know, Small items, bollards, et cetera, can be difficult to assess on scale drawings. All access routes will be free from hazards and obstructions and will be in accordance with the guidance, except for clearly identified in drawings and listed here. Now, the reason for that is, say he's put a 90 millimeter bollard on in the middle of the footpath and it's at one is to 200 scale, that's now 0.45 millimeters. You know, you shouldn't be expecting the building control person to go through the drawing with a microscope and a magnifying glass trying to find all these fiddly little things. You know, and in the layout of the wheelchair toilets, I mean, the important thing is, how big is the room, left and right dimension? Where's the toilet? Where's the sink? Where's the door? Where's the pull cord alarm? You know, you shouldn't be measuring the height of the soap dispenser and is the colostomy shelf long enough or not? Uh, you know, you can't be expected to check those things. So our template Consider that as a problem, and we specifically added the template to take care of that problem for you. Um, the drawings, they must support the report. Um, you can't just get the fire start drawing and change the name on it, or sometimes you get the fire start drawing and they don't even change the name. It's still marked down as fire start drawing. Um, you know, the external areas, you have to include them on the ground floor plan, I would always say the fire drawings, you have the front door and then a blank. So how do you access the landings and stuff outside the door and the, the footpaths coming up to it? Um, so I would always say three or four meters around the building has to be on the drawings, on the ground floor plan drawings at a proper scale, because you can't check it at once to 200. And invariably when I go back to the consultant saying, well, look, it's not clear from the report what you're doing, excuse me, um, you have to show me on the drawing, they grumble about it, but when the drawing comes back in, invariably there's actually is a problem. You know, there's, they might have forgotten to put in the guarding to the outward opening door, but then because they put the guarding in, it now blocks the ramp, in which case the ramp now has to change. So I would say ground floor plan should include the external info for three or four meters around the building. And then the key information, you know, where are the access routes? Mark it with a line. Which one are the accessible entrances? You know, and call it an entrance rather than calling it a fire exit. Uh, the corridors, how wide are they? Give me some dimensions. Um, some people keep asking me, like, what, what, what package do you use for scaling off the drawings? And I always answer, I never scale anything off the drawing. It says in the drawing, do not scale, so I'm not going to. So the dimension should be on it. Uh, and again, you know, we had the, the example there on the uh, for the toilets. You know, the template said everything would be exactly as per the guidance, unless listed, unless listed, which means you don't have to go dimensioning off the stupid fiddly small things like the height of the soap dispenser. 
the WC layout, you know, it is important because invariably they, they put it in wrong. Um, you know, but the mostly what I'm after is, you know, what's the left and right dimension? Where's the door? Where's the sink? Where's the toilet? Where's the pull cord alarm? Just to get the key info. And the main reason why I ask for the pull cord alarm is because it's always installed in the wrong place. Um, I was doing, I used to keep a count on how many were wrong. And I got up to, I think it was 41 out of 43. And then I went into a school building and they had four toilets and the pull cord alarm was right in three and it was wrong in one. So I talked to the electrician, the builder and the assigned certifier explained exactly where the pull cord should have been, why it was wrong where it was. They told me they'd fix it. I came back out three weeks later. They told me it was fine. And I found that they had fixed all of the correct ones to match the position, the one that was wrong. Um, and then stairs, you know, what's the rise in the going of the dimensions on the drawings? Conclusion for building control officers, it's a certificate of compliance. So you just need to be very careful of what you're actually granting. If you grant something that's less enforceable than technical guidance document them, you know, through either through poor wording or things have been left out, um, then you, what you're getting is something that's less enforceable. Um, and if there's a problem inside, like you mightn't be able to get it fixed. For consultant, if you think the consultant has been, if you think the, the building control officers have been picky, they probably are a bit. But that's probably because they have to certify that it's compliant and they don't get to go back afterwards to fix things. And you might be very well intentioned intending to comply, but the building control person has got to argue with the builder. Um, and, you know, I, over the years, I think I've inspected at least 100, well over 100 buildings um, that had DACs um, and they all used our template. Um, and because the wording is fairly ironclad and I was able to get the builder to fix everything. And there was very little wriggle room left for the builder to argue some silly things with me. Um, the wording, you know, when you write something, does it actually read what you meant it to write? Um, Connor mentioned earlier that the consultants should really read what they um, what they wrote before they submit it, which is true. But the building control people should actually proofread what's written to them, and does it actually mean what you thought it did when you read it the first time? Enforceability, poor wording leaves wriggle room for the builders to not comply. The bullet points was the question is, do you really need them all? You know, you wouldn't do it in the fire search. It causes an awful lot of problems. If you want to put all the bullet points in, if you want to give it to the client, you know, get a staple or unstaple a copy technique guidance document, then would be my opinion. But if you do feel that you do need them all, that's fine. Um, but you have to proofread them all. And the question is, are they all written exactly as the technical guidance document them, or are they less enforceable, or have they changed the wording so that it doesn't mean the same thing anymore? Provisions, are they covered? I, um, very often when we get an out-of-county consultant comes in to us, they, they've told us, they've given us hundreds of bullet points, they've written page after page after page. He's written a full page telling me all about how wonderful the accessible entrances are, but then they never actually told me which doors they were talking about. Or if they did, they told me that the main entrance would comply, but then they never forgot about all the other doors. So for a school, you know, you have the staff entrance. That's generally forgotten. You have the, the door going out to the basketball court. That will be forgotten. And you have the door going out to the playground. You know, why isn't that one accessible? So again, the danger of focusing on all the bullet points is that you wind up proofreading the application, not assessing it. Uh, provisions, are they covered? So technical guidance, some variables. Door widths, vision panels, handing of toilets. Is it a 15A toilet or a 15B toilet? Do I have an ambulance toilet or not? Um, a lot of the time, they, they can be forgotten with consultants. Um, make sure that they're pinned down, because if they're not pinned down, you won't get the builder to fix it on site. Deviations, if you're going to deviate from the guidance, that's fine, but you've got to justify it. You've got to explain why you have to deviate from the guidance, and then I can assess it. I can either agree with you or disagree with you. Um, you know, if, it, if you genuinely couldn't do it, and as Owen had mentioned earlier, as long as you're not creating a newer grant for contravention, particularly in existing buildings, you know, I might have to accept it. Um, what if I don't agree with you? Then you can you can appeal that decision, or maybe we might agree a compromise that, look, we can't have a 300 mil leading edge on the door, but you're going to give me a power door instead, so that balances it out. And then templates, look, again, consider adopting a template. If you're not giving the consultant a template, then you're using their template. And if you don't like their template, then why don't you use their, why don't you either use the LGMA one, use the Cork one, find another good one or write a good one of your own. And the key advantage of the template is it gets the information you want 
hopefully it pins down the information that you need. And if the consultant knows what you want, it makes it very easy for them to do the application and it makes it a lot easier for you to assess it. Um, and you know, the big thing is it cuts down on workload and grief. Thank you very much.